is called the weakness. Anybody's got any idea why that is? It's actually simple leverage. <clears throat> if our swords bind like this, I can press really hard while he only has to twist his wrist and just simply puts my uh, weapon aside. While, um, let's just assume that uh, the swords crossed each other, if my strength is in his weakness, I can easily control his sword. So this is simple leverage, and this was used in the uh, this was used in medieval fighting. It says so in the in the treatises explicitly. Um, that's one simple law. If you can just hold that. Then there's another uh, law which uh, is extremely important if we want to reconstruct Viking Age or Iron Age uh, sword and shield fighting. Now I need another volunteer, please. You look great. <laughs> What's your name? Yes. I'm S. Okay, um, if you just push against my hand, I push against yours. So he's standing strong against me, that's good. Don't lean in. <laughs> just push from the hip. That would be, yeah, that's what a martial artist would do. Now, the human body can give pushing or pulling power uh, full force um, only if he uh, makes itself extremely vulnerable against lateral pressure. Okay? So as soon as as soon as there's as soon as we are pressing here, we are weak here. Okay. Same if we uh, if you just press against my hand laterally. Now we are pressing this way. This makes us weak against push and pull. Okay. Thank you. Um, so that was a real sword. We call that a simulator because it's not really a sword. It's not sharp. So. And it's uh, it's got a rounded it's got a round tip and it's extremely flexible. So if that was a real sh uh, sword, how would a swordsman apply pressure uh, laterally or push and pull wise? What's your guess? Well, a swordsman would. What does a swordsman uh, want to do? He wants to, for instance, cut into his neck. He can only do that if he delivers pushing or pulling pressure, right? And this is done with which part of the blade? With the edges, right? That's the sharp parts on a real sword. So that means that um, if somebody, if uh, Mikkel strikes at me, <coughs> yeah, do it slowly, he's giving either pushing or pulling pressure. Now that makes him, uh, that makes him weak where? Makes him weak uh, at the sides, right? Mm -hmm. Did you get that? <clears throat> so, there's another, uh, there's another biomechanical law if, when you fight with weapons. If we press laterally, the both of us, the edge is always stronger than the flat. If I just simply twist my hand, I've got the control in the bind. Right? That's another law. It's, it's anatomy and physics. It's biomechanics. Okay? There's, it's been like that all the time, always. It's nothing we just simply made up. So, and this concept is extremely important when you use Viking shields. Now, this takes us to the big round shields. Um, this is a replica of a Viking round shield. Um, it's made from split planks, which are glued together with hide glue. Uh, they're covered with uh, linen on either side, and. Um, there's a rawhide edge stitched to it. Um, it might just as well have been covered with, uh, with, with um, parchment or, as we say, rawhide, which makes it heavier. Now, um, now we've got this grip here, the um, shield vessel. Uh, what's, the, what's the Danish word for that? Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and we've got this boss here. Now, when you see when you see reenactment, then um, that's what I used to do for, for 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 ages. Then people hold the shield up square on, presenting the flat. All right. <clears throat> Weapons are always cleverly designed. If I see this, it doesn't re it doesn't look that clever, really, does it? I mean, if that was the use of a shield to uh, simply ward off blows or thrusts or strikes, then you would come up with a different design. So why is the Viking shield designed this way? 
kind of strange that they would not uh, attach uh, straps to hold it this way. <clears throat> well, that's because uh, you fight differently here. And um, we came up with that uh, because we were considering not only the later manuals, but also um, biomechanics. Now, uh, we pick up swords to give you some impressions of the concepts we came up with, and I will explain why we think this might have been uh, part of uh, the repertoire of Viking Age fighters. So, um, this is what you usually see, people standing like this. Now, um, what your face, right? I'm going to do this. <laughs> uh, this is how people, no, no, stand square on. This is how people usually stand in reenactment. Now, if we use what, we've, what I've just showed, that the edge is stronger than the flat, if we use that on a shield, we could actually try to attack, not with a sword, but with a shield, like so, which at the same instant leaves us a gap here. Now, that looks more clever. And in fact, um, this is a technique that is shown in one of the later treatises. It's uh, actually uh, it's in one of uh, Hans Talhofer's treatises on fighting with the dueling shield, the judicial shields. I don't know if you have any idea how they look. They look pretty much like a like a huge, or like a spear about that high, with uh, with an oval uh, with an oval um, flat to it. They were extremely heavy. They could only rotate around these axes. But um, he does make use of the principle of using the flat against uh, the edge against the flat. Um, so a fighter who knows that concept would never stand like that because, of course, uh, can, he just can stand on the other side. <coughs> not, o not only does that turn his shield and create an opening, see that? It also blocks him here. All that he can do is slide down there. Now, um, of course, his sword may come down and possibly touch me, but it doesn't do, no, doesn't do much harm. If you do test cutting, you will see this is of little interest, particularly if it's only hacking. Swords only work if they cut. Yeah? And the cut is pressing and drawing or pe pressing and pushing. All of you know that when you're eating a steak and you just simply press down the, the knife on the steak, yeah, you won't get satiated. You have, to, you, have to, you have to pull and to push. So it's a cutting implement and that's, the same holds true for the sword. Now um, back to this very situation. So let's just assume for some reason in a fight I managed to pin him like this. Yeah? I pushed my shield into his armpit thereby completely controlling his sword while I could either chop off his head, uh, his, his leg and thrust him through the uh, torso. Now look where the sword is going down. It's coming down on the boss. Yeah? yeah? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Maybe if I, uh, if I retire. But I was thinking um, if I wanted to prevent this from happening, okay, I could improve the boss. Now that's a more elaborate boss. Okay. So if I get into a situation where the flat of a sword slides down, that's presented to those people as well. If you can just uh, attack my, my armpit. <laughs> Particularly if these shields were a lot bigger. A sled, these are what, 80 centimeters? Yeah. Well, how, how big are the largest shields found in the Iron Age? 105. 105, but that's quite a, that's quite a, uh, uh, quite a lot of reach. Now, uh, if that was even a bigger shield, though you attack me here, pinning this, then I would be standing here, and I might, uh, as my, as my sword comes down, I might, it might get caught here by these extensions that you see on Iron Age shields. Particularly if I'm retreating, because I know, because I know this attack is coming and my sword is cutting down, trying to get around, in, around the shield and thrust here, I might get caught on one of these. Yeah? So I think that's just a theory. It's, this is really f to give you uh, inspirations what to look for. I mean, particularly this uh, trumpet shape that you see on Iron Age uh, boss extensions makes a lot more sense if it was developed for something to catch a blade sliding down the shield 
than the spikes and the spikes were replaced by the trumpet shape and really uh, there's some literature saying that these spikes and the trumpet shaped extensions are they're probably weapons now um, if that was a weapon how close would Mikkel have to come to me in order to hit me with that weapon yeah. it just doesn't work I've got all the reach I need with this with a shield and with the sword it's a stupid idea this is this is punching this is punching this is punching uh, distance I don't even need a shield to prevent him from hitting me with the boss because if he comes there I just simply turn his shield just, just simply use leverage so we know these extensions on Iron Age's bosses can't be weapons. Whether my idea is correct, I don't know. But I think it's a more clever and more educated guess. All right, now, so what would it, what would it have looked like if, uh, if they fought? Oh, another thing which is really important. Uh, all these techniques um, that we're showing, like if he, if, he pins my, if he pins my shield, see his edge goes on the flat, he's got inish, uh, instant control. All these only work if the shield has a minimum diameter of 80 centimeters. If his, if his shield was any smaller, I, would, I could easily cut over here. Just push further, push further, push further and up. Yeah, like so. I would be able to cut over here if the shield was any smaller. So if with shields which are smaller than 80 centimeters, like the Viking shield, which has been found two years ago here in Denmark, these techniques wouldn't work. So there's a, there's a biomechanical optimum for the round shield being used with the edge to fight with um, that ranges, uh, depending on the size of the fighter, between 80 and uh, I'd say maybe 110 centimeters. Anything else is either too big and too heavy or too small to use these techniques. Um, okay, so, but then again, uh, why would I not strap my shield to the forearm? Because it's actually, after a while, this gets really heavy. They must have had really good shoulder muscle. <laughs> now, um, actually, you grow them pretty quickly if you do that training. Uh, but still, it would be helpful to have a strap here to, uh, to distribute the weight on my arm. Now, if somebody knows how to use a shield like Miguel does, it's pointless to attack this side because he just simply puts it forward. If I want to hit his head, just retreat and just ward off. Attacking on that side is pointless. That's what the shield is for. Yeah. So um, you go to this side. So here's another clue that we get from um, from Talhofer. As I said, uh, we make use of this rotating door principle. Yeah. It seems to be in a disadvantage, but actually it is not, because if uh, if I attack him this way. I can actually strike to his, uh, to his weapon side, hitting his hand or thrusting to the face. Meanwhile, warding off the main weapon. That's the main weapon. Yeah? Because uh, what he wants to do is he wants to attack my flat to turn my shield and thrust me, right? <clears throat> so as he does this, I let him come and strike to this side. I just take, pick up that pressure and strike at him. Yeah, if, his thrust, if his blow is already coming in, I just simply thrust at him warding off the weapon here. Okay, this is biomechanically so much stronger. He's just striking into the strength of my blades. I can still thrust at him even if he presses hard because there I'm using leverage. So these are biomechanical principles and knowledge from the treatises that we use to reconstruct how these were used. All right, um, so um, let's see if this would work out. We just try to do a little flow drill just to um, show you what you constantly strive to do when you fight with uh, this, kind of we this kind of weapon set. You try to put pressure and open, uh, to put pressure on his shield with your shield to find an opening. That's uh, opening is um, the part that we strike to. Yeah? Self-explaining, isn't it? <clears throat> and I've got, I've got this axis that works for me. Yeah. And of course, I also have the arm axis, so I can use this as well. Why would anyone use a position like that? Well, let's just assume he attacked my flat, turns, um, or I attack his flat, turn his shield and press it into the armpit, 
And now as he strikes, I feel the strike coming, and I go to this side. Yeah? He's completely sealed off, and I even stepped on his foot. <laughs> <laughs> so um, during this process, I may, my, may easily feel where the pressure takes me, and then I may end up in a position where this edge is toward his, towards his face. You just simply give him an undercut with the edge of the shield. Uh, here's another concept which we know from the treatises. It's fühlen, feeling. I feel in the bind, regardless of this, if this is a sword bind. If he gives me pressure, I feel where the pressure goes and I can, and I can use this pressure. If there's no pressure, I can work against him. So I need this bind, I need this contact to actually feel what my opponent is up to. And the same applies to the shield. So. an impression of how the pressure goes. This wouldn't be an impression of a real fight. <clears throat> to, um, to simulate a real fight, you would need safety equipment. Because the main attack to... Let's put on masks. <laughs> what you do with these is you use both weapons at the same time. This is the attacking weapon. This is the exploiting weapon. You create the opening with a shield, and at the same time, the sword moves and goes into the opening. It's like a matador. So if you turn the shield, at the same time you either thrust or cut. It's not boom, 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 or boom, boom. It's always at the same time, because, and here is uh, later fencing theory. We have something which is called tempo. That's from the Italian fencing. In the time frame, I can do something, he can do something. So if I would create an opening, like, um, just go into a re regular guard. I'm trying to not attack this side. I'm trying to attack this side because he's already standing pretty uh, sophisticatedly. So what applies here also applies on the inside. If I attack him like that, and don't strike at the same time, but my chance is gone. I have to strike at the same time. Okay? Created a gap, went through. Works really nicely. Miguel came up with an interesting concept of keeping touch with your edge and flat of the sword as you fence. that fast that a fight goes. Guard. End of the story. <laughs> so you see, um, as soon as you start experimenting with some martial background knowledge, using the later treatises, then having a look at the actual weapons, that tells you a lot because what are the differences between this sword and that sword? Now this is uh, quite a nice blunt replica of a Viking sword, except anybody knows what is inauthentic about the proportions? Too long. The handle is too long. Exactly. 
That was, I had it made longer in order to use gloves. I mean, padded gloves like those over there. This is really what you want to use when you do historical fencing. Because somebody who cannot hold a sword is done with. And that's the first target you see if he exposes his hand. So I thought, if I reconstruct Viking Age fighting, I need a longer grip so I can wear padded gloves or gauntlets. Now, I found out that uh, the original design is much better. Why? Because it's virtually impossible to expose your hand. Look, if I strike at you, how would I expose my hand? And if I, if I would expose my hand, a gauntlet wouldn't help me. <laughs> you just simply cut off my arm. So that's the reason, that's the reason why um, Iron Age and Viking swords didn't need long cross guards. They didn't need long grips. They could do with antler fittings because there is hardly any blade contact. It's a completely different, uh, it's a completely different um, system. This is about the shields. The shield, the shield is the weapon and at the same time the blade cuts but uh, the hand is always protected. You need a fast, light and sharp implement which is solid in the hand. And you don't need a wide cross guard because there's nothing to be expected coming down here. There may be occasional, there may be occasional um, situations where you actually do have contact, but then this is enough. And the same is true for organic fittings, particularly this Roman styles with the half bolts. Yeah? They perfectly safeguard your hand if there is a bind. Not if somebody strikes through your hand, fingers are gone and the organic fitting will not help you. But if there's an occasional bind and just slides down, see here, here he would hit me. If that was a wooden bowl, he would get stuck in the wooden bowl. So the Gladius and the Sparta, the earlier forms, are actually very clever if you don't fight with blade binds but with shield binds. Now, um, just to explain the difference, I will finally show you some of the shield <coughs> fighting that is actually to be reconstructed because we have actual sources for it. Now that is fought with uh, so-called bucklers. It's pretty apparent that uh, because of the difference in size, you would fight differently, right? Now, um, if I try to do, if I try to do the same techniques, this is probably not going to work. <laughs> Before I even get there, I'm dead. Which again is the reason why the round shield is that long, because you need that reach. Yeah, there is no no sensible middle size. Now. Um, Around the year 1000, maybe pretty uh, 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 slightly earlier, swords with wider cross guards come up, yeah, with wide cross guards. The typical type uh, 10 to 12 swords. And uh, I think they came up because horsemanship became more important and because um, fighting and disciplined order became more important. Because this is a really cool weapon for single combat. And it's uh, not that cool if you're in a formation. Actually, I think that that's my personal theory, that the overlapping shield wall is just uh, making up for the weaknesses of that shield. <clears throat> it's still a weapon that is perfect for single combat. And if you look at Viking culture, or at least what we know about it, or about uh, at Germanic culture, they are obsessed with single combat. If you look, if, I, if I'd go into a skirmish uh, in one of the Icelandic sagas, that's a perfect shield. I will not go into the details what differs here uh, in comparison to the domed shields that we have as well. Yeah? Oh, by the way, um, some of the Germanic, some of the Germanic uh, round shields may have been slightly domed, slightly convex. It still works to a certain degree, as soon as the bend becomes too extreme, these techniques don't work anymore. Why? Because here, the, arm, the shield is an extension of the arm. If the, uh, if the shield was curved extremely, I couldn't give any pressure anymore. 
That's a, uh, that's a different topic, it's just a side note. If anybody wants to ask any question about convex shields or maybe uh, curved kite shields and stuff like that, just approach me later. I'm happy to answer any question. But now to the, to the buckler. Now the buckler is a weapon that is not designed for the battlefield. You see it um, not primarily. You see it uh, as a sight uh, weapon for archers, for instance. But it's not you're not supposed to run into the front line with sword and buckler. It's not a good idea. If there are skirmishes or battle lines break up or you, uh, you plunder a city, then it's good to have this. Yeah? It's kind of like the, what the cult uh, single action, what the, what the cult was in, in the Peacemaker in the late uh, 800s, sword and buckler in the Middle Ages. Now, as I said, some of the concepts we had here don't apply to sword and buckler anymore. Why is that? Because of reach. So now the sword has to take over tasks that the um, shield was taking over earlier. So the main attack that somebody would deliver would be a strike from the right shoulder. That's what you do if you want to hit somebody, you have no idea how to use a weapon or a club, you hit like this, right? This is in fact one of the most common strikes in uh, historical swordsmanship too. So I'm going to show you how the 133 manuscript, that's a very advanced and sophisticated uh, manuscript describing fighting with sword and buckler, deals with that situation. So um, let's just assume the both of us enter a fight, we're standing in our guard, and now um, uh, let's assume he's an extremely um, competent swordsman, he steps forward and hits my head. <clears throat> okay, it's pretty hard to do with a shield being there. <clears throat> Now, if I was too weak because I'm worn out, he, might, he may strike through. Yeah, maybe, maybe, he caught, maybe he caught the flat if my shield turns, he still hits my head. So this is a typical attack that is to be expected. Also, he may just simply step offline and strike at me and I'm a slow slug. Oh. Okay. <clears throat> so um, the concept of uh, this manual is that as soon as you see somebody in a certain specific ward, these are the basic stances that you start your fighting from. Um, this is, for instance, called second ward. I know what he's up to. Why would I know what he's up to? What could he do against me? Except striking to, striking to the head. Is there anything else he could do? Well, just it doesn't matter if you say I something like stupid. It. Yeah, he could, he could cut down, <clears throat> cut, cut at my leg. Oh, magic. <laughs> I hit his head and he misses my leg. Oh, I must, have ha I must have the longer sword, right? Nope. Doesn't look like it. I must have longer arms. Uh, strange, isn't it? <laughs> Again, now without shields, just... So two gentlemen <laughs> wanting to hit each other. One gentleman's going for the leg. The other's going for the head. <laughs> now this is biomechanics again, and it's a principle that we find in the treatises again. It's called Überlaufen, and it works like so. Your arm, your sword is attached to your arm, your arm is attached to your shoulder. As you lower, you do the same, just lift. As you lower your arm, you lose reach. Okay? Because the arm is not on, uh, on a construction that goes... <laughs> <laughs> if, your, if your arm was attached to your ass, you would have won. Right? That's not the case. So uh, this is another of these universal laws which shows us you can reconstruct sword fighting because, of course, they knew it, and it's in the treatises too. So um, back to the situation. He cannot strike at my leg without being hit himself. So I know... The most, or he could, he could actually uh, change position. He could actually go to a different position, like so, for instance, in order to strike from that shoulder. Yeah? But that, as he does that, as he does that, I can attack. He wastes tempo. Okay? Again, fencing theory. So if he's, if, he, if he's clever, he has to take the most direct route. Just do it slowly. The most direct route for the sword is to travel on a straight line into the target. So when I see this position as I come to a fight, I can look into the future assuming he's a competent swordsman. If he's not a competent swordsman, he's going to die anyway. <laughs> if he is a comp competent swordsman, I just simply close this line. 
And now, uh, this, is only, this is going to be only one of two examples I'm going to give, but keeping the bind is eminent for all swordsmanship. You don't want to leave now, because this bind tells me what, he's, uh, what he will be doing next. But I'm closer to him now, so looking into the future through the bind will kill him. If there's little pressure here, I just simply go forward, block his weapons and cut through his face. If there, let's go to the field, you go to second, I go to Schützen and we go to the bind, right? Oh, what? I go here, yeah? If there's a lot of pressure, oh, I feel it through the bind, yeah? It's leverage. I go here, I go where the pressure takes me. And if there's kind of equal pressure, I step through. His sword can go nowhere. There's his, his shield, my blade, my cross guard, my buckler, and I cut forward, which opens his neck. While I cut forward, I twist my hand either this way or that way, but opens the wound and leaves a gashing wound, and that'll bleed him out if he doesn't die instantly. Okay, um, and the, the last thing I'm going to show is an extremely strange ward that you see in buckler fighting, and it's this one, which looks kind of stupid, yeah? Why would I want to do anything like that, yeah? Um, this is a ward which is designed to attack the weapon side. So if I'm standing like this, what? if we come to the field to kill each other, and I go to second to strike at him, and he's in this one, and he's faster than I am, then he can just simply attack my weapon side, the unguarded side. I just showed you how easy it is to ward off any blows to the head with a buckler. Do so, please. Just ward the blows off. See, to attack his head here is extremely difficult, even if I hit hard. And the same applies to my side, so if you just attack me here. <laughs> but I can easily attack his weapon side. And this is actually the same as we just saw with, uh, with a big round shield. Yeah? He can't attack up there. I can't attack up there where his shield would be. So I just go around. So um, this is just to show, to show some of the concepts and principles you can analyze in the older treaties and use them to um, try to make an educated guess how you would have used weapons that we don't have any written sources about. Thank you.